All right, guys, in this segment, what we're going to look at is using a duplicator. Now, we've, we looked at how to do it with a chisel and calipers and all of that stuff. But what we're going to look at now is if you're serious in the turning uh, or you got a lot of it to do, looking at a duplicator might be a good idea. They make really quick, nice work of making multiple parts. You know, you could take a duplicator and a lathe and you can go out here, and I know several guys who do it, just turning uh, stair balusters, you know, just do, just doing turning. You know, a lathe doesn't take up a lot of space, but, but a duplicator really, really can help you out. Now, the one we're, we've got on here now is a Vega. Now, the way the duplicator basically works is what, you, what you've got is you've got a cutter that's right here. And now the one in here is a carbide, but this is the, the high-speed steel one. And you notice the point on it. This cuts on a fine point, and then, of course, the two sides right here do the shearing. They cut a really, really nice... Uh, anything. They, they, they give a really nice smooth um, cut. But again, they don't, you know, you got to sand them a little bit, common sense. But the other thing with them is, is that in one of the biggest mistakes, they cut so well that people make is they try to go too fast and hog too much wood off. The other thing with a duplicator, is that you always want to go downhill. Now you're going to notice right here we have a stylus and there's different shapes for different patterns and different things. Here's some things I found with a duplicator that really works nice. First of all, I always turn my, turn it just a little bit large that's to get you know get it roughed out then i come back and i set it to my exact size now on this one the size is set by the stylus and where you know you can, and you can make it smaller you can make it larger by where you locate the stylus at the biggest thing is is that again they take wood off so well that people have a tendency to go too hard. And when you do that, you know, you can bog your lathe, you, you, you can take chunks out, take your time. Now what I told you, always go downhill. What am I talking about? Well, if you're on top of something like this bead, which is the leg that we did earlier, if you are on top, what you want to do is turn the top of this to its dimension. Then you want to ease down this way, ease down this way. But don't try to just take it all. It's not going to work like that. Take your time. Let's take a look at the duplicator in action. Okay, guys, the first thing is, is this thing's going to produce a lot of chips. You can bet on it. And, like I said, it's going to take a lot of material off. When you start, what you want to do is you obviously don't, you can't start dead into the wood. So what you're going to do is come back and you can adjust, you know, this is going to be my corner. And I can adjust to how much cut I want it to start off taking. Because the first thing I want to do is I want to come into my round. Now because of the V shape of the cutter, something like a square corner or something like that, you're going to have to clean that up with a chisel. Okay, the V shape's not going to, so just as we did before, I've taken a saw and I've, I've sawn all my corners and I've got my tape wrapped around to prevent tear out. The other thing I've done, I've got a block here and I've got a stop here. That's going to keep me from, from coming past my point and slamming into my tailstock 
or accidentally coming too far one way or the other. Now once I've got it set for the amount of cut I want to take, then what I need to do is I need to back it up so that it's free and then I can start the turn, then I'll ease into it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to lock it down, back it up so I can get a little bit more cut. Then I'm going to ease back in and go the other way. Now one of the things you always want to do, if you're right up against something, you don't want to go in. You want to back off of it a little bit, then go in, come back this way, then go down. And the reason for that is, otherwise that shear on, that, on your wall right here, it's going to grab. So I'm going to back off a little more. Come back. Now, I'm going to show you a trick I use all the time. I take a good leather glove. I'm getting a little bit of spindle whip. You're going to see what I do. about 1200 RPM and that may on camera look a little rough but it sands up pretty quick but here's the other thing I can now take and I can actually if I speed it up and go and move this slower I'm gonna get a better cut I'm about 2200 RPM right now and I'm just gonna let this ease in small light cut Now my stylus is already engaging. It's showing me the top right there. Got a little sawdust here against my stop. All right, I'm going to back down just a little more. Now, when I back in, what I like to do is to get, again, I don't want it dropping in. I don't want it to slam in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in at my deepest point. You can, you can see right here. 
I've got a good ways to go, so I'm gonna go in a little bit. Then I'm gonna come back to my top. Then I'm gonna ease down. I'm gonna come over. Same thing. Then I'm gonna take off a little more. Now what will happen if you try to come in this way, it's going to dig into your cove. It's not going to give you a clean cut. Alright, I'm down to my final cut. Now, When we get to a groove, and we've got a groove here that's just on the back side of a bead. All right, Sherry, I'm starting this segment over. Okay, when we're cutting this, right now we're at a point we've already laid this out and we've cut this but we've got this groove right here. Now the duplicator's already denoted where it's at. So I have two choices. One is I can try to go ahead and cut it with the duplicator or I can just do it later with the chisel. If you elect to do it, and that's one of the beauties of a duplicator is it lays everything out so nice for you. You don't, and sizing. So what I'm gonna do right here is just, usually I just do it with the chisel. But what I'm going to do right now is show you how to do this. Because again, we don't want to just drop down and try to take all that wood out at one time. If we do, we're going to chip it up. So what I do is I get on that point and I back myself off. Where I'm not even engaging the wood. Then I turn and start my lathe. and I just let it ease in. Then I back it out. Now, I'm already good right here. I know that. So now we're gonna go down. Once we reach a point that we're starting to pick up more material because of the taper, then we're going to want to adjust how much we're taking off. I can go back uphill because I'm not going to be taking all of that meat. Now I'm at a point I'm almost engaging. I stop. I'm going to back off just a little more and I'm going to go back down. All right, at this stage of the game, my stylus is now touching here, but I'm kind of chunky because I've just been taking it off in segments. Now I'm going to go back and clean it up.
Now, I'm going to get on top of this bead. Because I've already done this side, I can drop off. I can't drop off that side because I got way too much material. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce the cut. Maybe even a little more, huh? Again, easing into it. The last thing I'm going to tell you is on this too is don't exit quickly. Let it cut slow. If you exit real quick, you can get chipped right there. The other thing you never want to do, never, ever, ever, you don't want the stylus to come around this end and drop in. You do, you're going to get a really nasty looking, you're not going to be happy. All right, now. I've got the leg turned, roughed out, but I'm still bigger than what I should be. So I'm going to go back and fine tune it and get my sizing correct. Now the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to come back to right up against what's going to be my square. You can see how much oversize I am. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to loosen my stylus and adjust everything to be exactly where I want. I may even switch stylist here. I think I will. Because I want a little longer protruding down. All right, that's dead zero. Now, I'm going to come in, see where we're at, and let's go. Okay, I ran into an issue, and I knew it would, because I wanted to show you this. The biggest thing you have, to, the other thing you have to do is you need to make sure that you're perfect as far as, or you're correct in as far as where your duplicator is sitting on your lathe. If I bring this up, my cut head, now this, all this is a piece of wood I turn perfectly straight. You could just as well use a nice straight piece of wood that's set on here in your centers. I'm touching here. As I come down, you're going to notice something. I'm off probably about an eighth of an inch, which is the sizing on my bottom, and it shows it being off. So I need to adjust my cutter or my duplicator to make sure that I'm in line. The other thing you can do is to use the points on your um, on your tailstock and on your headstock. Simply as that. Simply put. Okay, I'm going to adjust this and we'll be right back. All right, guys, here's what I'm doing. I'm lining my center point up right with the tip. I'm locking it down. Then I'm going to come down to my tail stock, and I can see, obviously, the difference. So I'm just going to loosen my bracket a little bit and get it in line. It's hard. You can't see it off in that angle, but it's back about an eighth. All right, guys, I'm reset. Now I'm ready. But I want you to see that. That's a critical point. It's making sure that you're set up from point to point. 
The other thing you want to do is to make sure you're hitting in your center all the way down. And there's adjustments in here to compensate for that. You can adjust your level. All right, just roll on down. Now I'm going to come back and clean up my top, but again, I don't want to slam into this really hard. I just don't. So I'm going to get on top, set myself to zero, and then ease into it. I'll get a much cleaner, nicer cut too. All right, now, what happened? I'm hanging here. I'm not working smoothly. If that happens, it's usually, this is too tight. Over here, you also have an adjustment for your spring tensioner. You wanna keep proper tension on that so that it will pull you nice and smoothly. Now, see, I work a lot better, okay. Okay, we've just replicated this leg, this particular one we're turning is uh, out of some old ash. Now when I go back on the lathe, I'm gonna do a little bit of sanding. I'm gonna touch up my corner, clean this center up where I left it a little large and we have it duplicated. They're not hard, but they're like any tool, guys. You've got to work with them a little bit to get the quirks out. I showed you a few I've ran into. And I'll tell you also, in the back, I've got a big commercial one. It's not a Vega. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a lathe made purely for duplicating, but it's done by hand. It's not a CNC or something like that. But it's the same quirks. You know, again, don't, what you don't want to do is let your cutter slam in you want to take slow, easy passes. Now, and, and again, I'm going to say this one more time. You saw this thing putting out a lot of dust and dirt. You know, to keep your track clean, a little something to blow it off. 
uh, you know, they, they just work so nice. They work so nice, and you can move through a lot of material quick. Again, I say it again. That's one of the problems with, with duplicators is people try to go way too fast. And again, downhill. Always going downhill. Turn to your highest point, then ease down those hills. You know, it's like anything else, whether you ever rode a sled on the snow or you ever rode a bicycle. A whole lot easier going down, or walked. A whole lot easier going downhill goes a lot smoother than it does going uphill. Same thing with a duplicator. The last thing I want to talk to you about on duplicators is that in this case, what we're using is we're using that actual pattern that we turned to replicate with our stylus. You can also, and it works quite well, is take, a, take something and cut you a pattern and it fits and screws in here and it'll follow the pattern. Now just for information, this is about a 3 16 quarter inch piece of plexiglass. It makes, you know, and sands your edges a little bit after you've sawn out whatever it is you want. It makes for one of, it really makes for a nice pattern material. And all it simply does is you make your pattern and it sits right in the slot and you lock it in place. Make for some really, really slick, quick turning. Duplicators. When you really want to get with it and you really want to have some fun. All right, guys, I'm going to show you another tool that I really, really like a lot. Now, these are called the Nova Chucks. This is called a Supernova. And they're expensive. I'm not going to tell you they're not. And you can get them for the midi lathe, and in this case, this one's, you know, for the bigger lathe. Now, here's another version. This is one Woodcraft makes. Essentially does the same thing. But what this does, the way these work is, is the first thing, you have to buy an insert that goes into the chuck to fit your lathe. And you're going to see them, like this is an inch and a quarter, eight teeth per inch. Okay, and that's a pretty common on, on most of your larger lathes. On the midi lathe, I think it's running one inch, eight teeth per inch. Some of them, and the book you've got, with your lathe should tell you, and if not, you can measure the diameter, you know, how far it is, and pretty much figure it out and count your, anyway, count your teeth. But you have ever how many teeth per inch, and so you have to buy an adapter as well as the chuck to fit your lathe. And all it does is it screws in, and this goes on, you drive. Now, I don't have any, um, jaws set up on this one, so I'm going to show you the supernova. And I'll explain that. This simply screws onto your shaft. Now what I have set up on here now is called spigot jaws. But you can get them in all kind of different sizes, and what it is is the jaws are interchangeable. And it has to do with the openings in here. And you can get them, I mean, in all kind of different sizes. You can see how the jaws open and close. I mean, you can get them to the point that, that they've even got rubber. If you've turned a bowl, that you can actually mount these on here and mount your rubber tabs out here and close it on a bowl to hold the bowl, the whole outside of the bowl so you can work it. These are called cold jaws. But again, they come in all kind of different sizes. But what I'm going to show you is this is the spigot. And it would extend out enough that I could actually probably get a one inch tenon in that. 
I think so. But what we're going to do is remember me telling you about just like in this case, this is a finial blank, of just taking and drilling and putting a regular dowel into a piece of uh, wood. So what this does is this simply locks it in place. It holds it by one end. Now if you recall when we were turning our finial and we were trying to get right out there to that little end, that's a little difficult as you saw, but you can do it. Having one of these chucks helps a lot. Here's the way I usually work them. I usually get close and without being set up on a really high speed, I haven't even marked the center here. I'm going to let it find its own. Now here's the nice thing about these. Now I'm using the center just to take the pressure off of the that little half inch tenon. And we're not going to do anything fancy here. gonna imagine this is a this is a uh, finial Here's the cool thing about this chuck. Now I'm going to back off on this just a little bit. I think I'm a little loose. Good 
this walnut does not want to cut. Get a better chisel. Alright, it's fighting me. Alright, Sherry, I'm gonna say now this is the nice thing about this. Let me get this thing turning nice. I don't know why it's not. I do too now. I know why it's not turning real nice. Yeah. Oh, I can smooth that up a bit. I just happened. That's what I want. I just want that off of there. All right, guys. This is the thing I like the most about this chuck, is that as you can see, I'm free. I'm free turning, so I can get out here and that go easy. And on finials or my ends or things like that, I can get right in here and I can sand and finish out the ends. I can also use it, but the biggest thing is I can use those tenons, I can hold it by the tenon, which ensures me that I'm gonna be dead on the money with my tenon. Novachucks, that's how they work. Again, I want to emphasize to you that what you want to do is you want to be able, is I always use the live center, I always use that until I've got the majority of my turning done. And I leave, and I get all my sanding, everything done, the last thing I address is the very point. That just adds that much more stability, but it allows me to cut it loose. Again, like I said, there's chucks and jaws. You can do everything you can think of. And uh, when we do some finial, I mean some uh, rosette turnings, these will come into play again. All right, guys, I'm gonna show you something here that really doesn't have anything to do with turning, but since we're doing the bed post, I'm gonna throw it in here just because it really helps to dress up one. And a lot of times, you know, this transition point in a turning is very difficult to deal with. And you know, what do you do? Well, in the case of this bed post, what we're gonna do is what's called a lamb's tongue. And this is the pattern and profile for it. And I'm gonna show you how to do it because it's a little different on a turned item. Now all I do is I trace this on and what it, and I'm gonna show this to you just in a second. And trace both sides. Now the thing I want you to notice is right here I have a little teeny collar turned. And that's my point that I go from. Now these are not hard to do. Now what we want to do, you can see it creates a round, comes up, rolls over, and scoops in. It's a lamb's tongue. Now the easiest, I'm, I'm, the only thing we don't want on this is we don't want a perfectly flat corner. 
but that's why we've got it on both sides. Now I'm gonna show this to you. What I do is I take a saw and I, and I start right here. And I come down this side a little bit, just enough to get a little bit of material out, loosen it up a little bit. Then I come down the other side. I, I don't really cut hard into the middle. Then all I'm gonna do is take a chisel and I'm just gonna get the worst of this material out of here. And I'm coming in from both sides. Again, I'm not flattening it. I'm coming from both directions. I'm, cre I'm leaving the sort of the peak in the middle. I just want to get the worst of it out of here. I'm just using a bench chisel. Once I've got it down like that, which is pretty rough, all I got to do, it, this is a, one of those Japanese rasps, kind of like a sawtooth, but you can use any one. Just kind of round it over. Follow your line a little bit. Now I'm going to do two of them just so that I can show you how it makes your top look. I don't have a saw, it's okay. What you're going to do is round right to your line. Now once you've carved all four and you've got all four laid in here, you can actually turn, turn this on, take a little piece of sandpaper and it'll sand a lot of most of this for you. Finer file. This rolls up. <laughs> Sweeps over, goes over and comes down. You can carve all this, but
and you now have lamb stumps. A little sanding, a little cleaning, nothing major. Here's what you notice. You've got the little sweep this way on the corner, comes down this way, drops off, and then what this does is this creates you a nice, oval, I don't know if you want to call it an ovalo or whatever it is, but it creates a nice capital type look that makes for a really nice transition. Really looks good when it's in a bed, and I usually do them top and bottom, have them coming down. I also use this on cases a lot, where I'll run part the way down a case, and then I do a little lamb's tongue and another little lamb's tongue on each end, just to end that transition. The other thing you want to do is when you're doing this is to pay attention right here at yeah that's the bottle stopper one what you want to do is you want to pay attention right here as you come around this has got to have a little bit more but you want to try to keep this circle right here about the same Kind of blending that whole top together. Sanding, you know, with a, with a strip of sandpaper really helps that. Lamb's tongue. Not hard at all. All right, guys, we're going to take a look at what's called outfeed turning. Now, Outfeed turning is when you're turning like a top or a platter or something of that nature. Something you can't turn within the confines of your lathe. Now what we did was we removed the tailstock and the tool rest on this lathe. And we sl simply slid the headstock down to the end of the lathe. Now a lot of your lathes, the head on it will rotate for outfeed, tur outfeed turning. In either case, what we've got is we wind up with our headstock out and just out hanging over the side of the lathe. Now, what we're gonna do, and a lot of guys use this technique for turning big bowls and big things. And I've turned some, I've turned some 32 inch tabletops on it. Now what you're going to use is what's called a face plate. And what a face plate is, is it's something that we're going to use to attach the piece of wood we're going to turn, which we'll look at. And it simply screws on. To your lathe. Then right here, what we've got rig, this is a rig. We took an old, we took some, welded up, took an old brake drum and we added some pipe and welded it up to make us a tool rest. Now, a lot of, you can buy all kind of different little setups that will actually work off of your tool rest and come around and set right here. Or you can, like we did, you can rig yourself up something. But you want to be able to get your tool rest about center or just below center of what you're going to be turning. Now what we're going to look at is how we get our wood on the lathe. All right, here's what I've got. I've got my piece of wood that I'm going to be turning. In this case, just a piece of cherry. I squared it up drew my diagonals, took a compass, and drew my circle. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add to it an auxiliary piece of wood because I need to screw this face plate on, and I really don't want to be screwing into the back of my piece. And I've got it squared up and X'd out. 
Now here's something, and I've mentioned this to you. If you've got it lined out, X'd out, when you line up all of your corners correctly, where everything is matching, you will be dead center. Just the way it works. Probably some formula for that in geometry, but line up your line up your corners with your X marks, and you will have it. That'll give you the center. Now, there's a couple different ways of attaching this piece of wood, and what I'm using here is a piece of three-quarter inch plywood. That's my favorite. And the reason for it is, is that in order to attach this, I need to do something a little kind of out of the box. I don't want to screw it on. Because again, then I'm going to be, you know, putting holes into the back of the piece I'm turning. There's two ways that I use, actually three. One is I will use some double face tape. And you're going to see it out there as Turner's tape and everything else. Now the first thing you're going to notice is I've got a pretty good size backer on this. Because no matter what I do, once I'm through turning, I've got to get this off. I like the plywood because I can actually come in here and just take a chisel and chisel it loose and then sand the back of, sand or scrape the back of it and remove the tape or the glue. The second way I do it is I will use a little center dot, four corners of a cyclonate or CA glue. And the third way I do it is the same thing with a little bit of five minute epoxy. The CA glue, if you use the uh, activator, dries really brittle, hard. And so it'll usually snap loose for you pretty well. But when you start chiseling it, always chisel up into the wood. Don't try to chisel right on, the, right on your good wood. You know, to sand or scrape a little residual off, you know, it's not going to be a big deal. But in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a little double face tape. And I'm just going to mark it out so that I am comfortable that I get everything handled. Now the other reason I like using a pretty good sized piece is that that gives me a good stable backer on here. end of it got a little dust on it. Now, just to be sure, not take any chances, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a little bit of cyclonate in the center. Cycloanalate, CA, the hot glue, instant glue, crazy glue, whatever you want to call it. But there's one thing I'm going to do before I do that, is I'm going to go over here the bandsaw and I'm going to knock these corners off. I don't want these sharp corners turning because if my hand hits it, those are knuckle thumpers. They'll, they'll thump your knuckle good. Make sure I'm well lined up here and I'm good to go. 
I'm just eyeballing, making sure my corners are ready. Because when I put this CA glue on here, it's going to be all she wrote. activator right in the center. All right, that's on. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to band saw pretty close to my circle. do is I'm going to attach my face plate. Almost every face plate will have the holes to where you can do exactly the same thing. You can line yourself up perfectly. In this case what I've got is I've got this way, this way, here and here that gives me my diagonal and all I'm doing is sighting this looking down through the center and I'm also sighting my holes to make sure I'm centered up as good as I can get. Now another way you can do this, depending upon the size of your opening, is take a compass and draw the circle and then just right in the middle and then just line it up. That looks pretty good. Now I'm just going to screw it on. Make sure your screws don't go through your plywood. camera off. Alright, now I did this just to show you. My double face tape it's holding fine, but let's assume it's not. What I do is I'll take again a little bit of CA glue. Now I use the thick because I don't want I don't want it running all under everything. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna squirt a little activator in there.
Let it harden up good. Takes just a minute for the thicker stuff. Plus, I don't like the really fast activator. All right, I'm down. When I pulled it, I pulled two of them. Show you. All right, make sure you're down good and tight. And let's mount it to the lathe. Now, depending upon the size of your face plate, sometimes some of them will have a set screw that you can use to just kind of make sure it's locked in good. If you have a variable speed lathe, at this point, you want to start out slow. Because we've got to get things balanced. See, when I turn up, I'm getting a lot of vibration because I'm out of balance. So now what I'm going to do is I want to get things going. All right, guys, one of the things with outbeat turning, you, you can see the center right here. Because of the rotation, you never want to turn on this side. You always want the turning to be coming into the chisel, not up from. This way it's gonna to try to throw it at you. So stay away from the center, stay away from the center to your right. And what I gotta do now is get this thing balanced up. So what I'm using is simply my skew, and I'm gonna I'm cut it. You would think you would come in from the outside. I find it better to come from this side. You see where it's whopping? That's another thing. It's completely out of balance. that out of balance what you want to do is look over and get your parting tool As I go through, I'm, I'm whittling off my little outside rim too because I don't want this thing coming. I want it to come off in slivers and not as a 
chunk and just go through easy. Now once I start getting close to taking this rim off, I'm going to go to a point just to cut it off. Once I get down close, I'm going to come around to the back. And the reason I'm going to do that is I want to be able to cut this without pushing through and taking a chance on chipping out my back there. The other thing I can do is what I'm going to do now. See, I can come in right here and cut. Or, because I'm now thin and I'm not going to be tearing out, is I'll take a scraper and just ease it off. But you can see it's hitting hard, so just very gently. Then I can clean that edge right on up. Be aware of something. These edges right here are sharp. You're using a hardwood like this cherry, they are sharp. So keep them down. Now, you're still out of balance. Now some of that's going to have to do with some flex in the front here. But a lot of times what it will do is it will have something, it, a lot of times it can have to do with your backer plate. So what I'll do is I'll ease in here very gently. You can hear it. You can't see it, but you can hear it. What I'm doing is I'm taking a little bit off that. Just to get it balanced. And you'll feel it start, you'll see it, and you'll feel it start to smooth out. Now be careful you don't turn off your little corners that are glued with your cyclonate. Alright. I'm down pretty smooth until I get it fully balanced out. Remember we talked about turning that scraper over and kind of sanding that edge? Alright. Now we gotta to go to our face. Alright, Ricky, you need to get back over there. Alright. All right, now here we are at the face. Again, I'm gonna take my scraper.
Again, what I'm looking at doing is getting balanced out. I'm gonna get, I'm not, I, I see my center. First thing I wanna do is get a flat surface. Now this is another good place for a bowl gouge or thumbnail or whatever you want to call it. Like I told y'all, I always mess, mess the names of these tools up. And I probably need to sandbag my tool. Now, I can increase my speed a little bit. So I'm gonna show you this. You get too much of an angle on this that can catch. So I want you to get as vert almost vertical. Like this. See it? I'm using this part of the tool right in here. You can see when I hit that edge, it wants to pull me. Now to be honest with you, I should be just a little higher on this. Back to the scraper. Now I'm going to start dishing. See it pull? Avoid those centers. Now I'm in a lot better balance. I'm gonna give me a little bit more speed here. I'm gonna get this up a little higher. I need to be up a little higher to get into that middle. Alright guys, here's what I want you to notice. I got my steady rest up, my tool rest up, rather, right at my center point, and I'm able to get in tighter, much tighter.
And you can see the surface. You see the little bit of tear out we're getting here? That's where once we get down, we're going to want to be really careful with that. Because that's just, that's that, again, that's coming in on this angle. Okay, now on the scraper, if I actually go a little lower, it's going to scrape a little better. But we're just hogging it out right now. All right, now I'm going to switch back to my bowl gouge, or my fingernail gouge, whatever you want to call it. Now I can also use just my regular spindle gouge. Again, getting that shear. See that? That's a catch. And you see what it does? It can just rip it out. That has to do with taking this gouge and getting in too close like this. Again, you want here and you want to get that shear. Now this fact that my steady rest is moving around isn't helping me a bit. So we're going to take care of that. Alright guys, I'm a lot more stable now. I still got a little bit here. You're not, you, you don't even want to know how I fix this. I'm going to tell you anyway. Roll that camera down here. My drum kept wanting to wiggle because it was out of, it wasn't level, my floor wasn't level. So I put a ring of body filler around it, set the drum in it on a piece of wood, and then I got me some a couple 50 pound bags of sand and sandbagged her down. Give me a lot more stability. I would much rather be able to attach to the lathe. But sometimes you just can't do that. Now, we've gone through and we've looked at different chisels. We looked at the gouge. We looked at all of those to hollow this out. My, again, my personal, I, I like the thumbnail, the bowl gouges, whatever you want to call it. But I still like a scraper. It's just safer and does a nice job. Now, you see me use the straight one. Now, I'm going to go with the rounded scraper for a little bit. Let's take a look at it. I've already hit it, hit it a little bit. Now the other thing I want to show you is to check your depth. You can simply hold a straight edge up here. And measure and check where you're at. I haven't turned my outer rim yet. I'll do that last. Okay, we're going to turn a little bit more with the uh, curved scraper. Now I'm just going to use the edge of it right here. You can see what I'm doing. When I get down to the point and I get to this center, I can actually lift it out just a little bit. See what I'm doing? There you go. Now I'm going to turn this scraper over. And I got a surface that'll sand up pretty easy and pretty quick.
Now I can also come back and true the surface a little better using my straight scraper. Again, when you're using a straight tool like this, whether it be this or it be something like one of the bench chisels we talked about, what you got to be careful of is these corners catching on you, so be careful. Now because we're shearing across the grain, we're always going to have this little bit of a rough spot. Even if we go in reverse, we're just going to reverse it. Going in reverse, meaning we start it turning this way and we shear it coming down on that side. It's always a little bit of that seems to be in there. Alright, that'll sand up pretty good. Now I'm ready to go come up and do whatever I'm going to do to my edge. And what I've got is a small round nose scraper. Okay, I think what I'm going to do is just put a nice little bead on it. But I'm going to turn just a little flat spot right here. I've got a little bit more ring there than what I want, so I'm just going to blend that up again using the small curved scraper. Still got a little bit of wiggle, a little bit of imbalance in this. So I'm just going real slow and easy. Get it out. Now I'm going to jump back to my three-point tool and create my bead.
I don't know. Still got plenty of nice size there, nice thickness. So I'm going to clean up a little more and blend everything. You know, this would look good with a little cove set in it. I think that's what I'm going to do. I think I want this cove edge down a little further, so I'm going back to that small round nose scraper. I'm liking that a lot better. I want to narrow that bead up a little bit. You notice I turned the scraper over. Just want to sand that bead in there. There we go. Now I'm going to jump around, move around, and get to the back and turn my back edge. All right, guys, at this stage, I'm rounding this edge. Now, normally I would probably take a skew and come in this way, but I wanted to show you this. I'm, using, I'm, I'm again using that straight scraper. But the difference is, is I'm not pushing in at all because I'm going from flat grain to end grain to flat grain so just let it do its thing see I'm just barely letting that tool touch I mean, you can tell by how fine the shavings are coming off. Then when I have a nice profile that I like, then I'm done.
Now it's a simple matter. Sand it up, chisel the back off, scrape hand plane, get your material off. But right now I can sand all of this up nice and smooth. Now the problem and where you got to be careful on sanding this is get your, if you got a steady rest, Again, it's the same thing applies. And I'm working backwards here, but you gotta be careful you get over here, it's gonna squirrel you around. So where you wanna sand, the other thing with sandpaper, if you've got this tool rest in there, here's a caution. If you've got this tool rest set up in there and you're turning and a good heavy sandpaper can pull you it can pull your finger down in there. That's not fun. You can take your little sanding block and work right between here. Sand it up. Again, one of the things with sanding on a lathe is getting the sandpaper into it. And that's why firm sandpaper oftentimes to give you really nice, maintain your crisp turnings is your best alternative or your scraper. But work with it until you're able to turn something that doesn't require a super amount of sanding. Now, remember we talked about this? and we rounded these edges and I told you they were thumb knockers, you better believe it. The way I handle that is I get up here and I ease over. I don't even get close because that will, you won't do it but once, it will sure black your fingers. Send you in the house squalling. You know, I've got a little saying out there that says sometimes foul language is part of the creative process. You let that puppy start thumping your fingers a couple times, you'll understand it. All right, we've got it. All right, Rick. We got it. All right, guys, I'm going to show you this. Now, this just works all. Don't try this, because if you do, you're going to like it. I promise. Yeah, now, even though I got an air random orbit sander, electric does just as well. Watch. And I don't even, if I don't, even if I don't turn it on, you watch this. But if I turn it on, <laughs> you can flat give it the sand, quick and easy. I'm covered in sawdust. I unscrewed it from the uh, lathe and took the backing plate off face plate, now I got to pop off my call or the, the backer. And anywhere you use the CA glue, pop it a little bit with the chisel. Pop them loose. Don't pry the whole thing. If you do, you're going to do some damage. And you notice again, I'm getting in between. And you can see why.
and you see the way that CA glue will, will migrate under there? And I told you I used the thick, and, and there's a reason, because I don't want it to get any more out there. Now once I get all of this off, it's a simple scrape, sand a little bit on the back, and we got what we want. Now, if you look out there, there's a lot of finishes that you can apply on the lathe, and they're called friction polish or friction finishes. They do pretty good as long as it's not something that's going to be used a lot. They're basically, for the most part, they're shellac and wax. And the way they work is as it's running, you're applying the finish and the heat generated from the, the wood turning dries and sets the finish. Now with that said, I made the comment about heat. When you're sanding one of these, in here and it's spinning on a lathe, and you take your finger and you try to get in these little tight places with a little piece of sandpaper, it'll burn your finger and it'll do it quick. So take it easy guys, don't get yourself burned up. What is this thing? I don't know. We could make a little tilt top table. We could turn another one and make a lazy Susan. Or we could just set it in the center of the table and use it for most anything. Outfeed turning. Really not all that difficult. But I hope you did see the advantage of making sure you got a good, solid, firm st steady rest or tool rest, that's important. And take your time. And again, as we've seen, you know, the scrapers, they're not as fast as some of the other tools, but they're a lot friendlier to use. And again, small light cuts, just keep on going. Outfeed turning. All right, guys, what we're going to talk about now is very similar to what we just did or what we did in the outfeed turning. But the difference is we're going to be able to do this on the lathe. Now, something like this rosette. Now, this is a fairly large one. But this is a face grain. And I'll show you that in just a minute. In other words, there's no end grain in this. The end grain is out here. But then you take something like this little shaker knob, now it's an end grain, now there's a reason. Okay, an end grain where you've got the little teeny tenon turned on it. When you put this into a piece of furniture, you want that end grain so when you pull on it, it has more strength. But that also presents you a little bit of an issue because all the faces of your knobs or pulls are going to be end grain, a little tougher finishing. Now here's a trick, sand them up super slick. But the other thing we can do, we can actually reinforce this and make it get a face grain turning, but yet have the strength of an end grain. How do we do that? Well, we do it the same way we're going to turn this. What I did on these, as you can well see, my choice in this was to drill my flat grain, and I simply glued a dowel in it. Now, when this is done, this dowel is sawed off, and of course, this is going to be used in a gooseneck on a piece of furniture. So what's going to happen, so you're not going to see this back at all. And I'm going to use our chuck. Now that allows me to turn not only to the outside, it allows me to turn completely across the face. An alternative to it, if we don't have the chuck, would be similar to what we did in our 
without feet turning, and that would be to use a faceplate. Now, we could use a smaller plate and simply screw this on, screw our block of wood on, or we could si simply, you know, use an auxiliary piece of wood just like we did, and just simply mount it. Now, I've got the tenon on that, and we could just simply mount this on here and screw it onto the lathe, and we're good to go. Again, my choice is to use the chuck. But the same thing applies, just like that outfeed turning. We need to get our center. And we need to knock those corners off. So what I do again, this is just a rough block of wood. I just center it up, take my compass, draw it, bandsaw it close to the size, and I'm ready to go in the lathe. The only thing about a face turning that will present you issues is the same thing we ran into with the outfeed turning, and that is simple, is that we've got this flat grain. We've always, we're, at there's some point, we're always cutting sort of against the grain. Again, the scrapers, and just take your time and go easy. Let's turn one just to get a feel for it. Now again, this is just roughed out on the bandsaw. It's a block of wood. It's not even, it's, you know, it's going to have a lot of wobble to it. So again, we're going to start on as low a speed as we can. See what I mean? Now when we saw this chuck used last time, one of the things that we were able to do which we can do here to start is to bring is to bring our live center or our tail stock up and support it a little more because this is the point where at the point where the most unbalanced. Then I simply clean it up. But again, I'm cutting in grain, a little tougher, so go easier. Now I'm going to start with a gouge and just go real slow and easy. You know, if this was a bowl while I was turning, man, I could have the chips flying everywhere. But as it is, it's going to shear on down pretty nice. Now all I have to do is, is, again, take it down the sides. Like I said, I'm using the gouge. And again, I've got this chisel set to where I'm slicing. I've got a pretty high angle on it.
Now one of the things I've got in this, as you can well see, I'm thick on one side, thin on the other. So I don't really even have a nice surface in the back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to back cut it. One of the neat things about a lathe is it'll allow you to do, it, it'll let you just straighten up about anything. So I'm going to lock this in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my chisel and I'm going to come in just like this and I'm going to clean this back up. Now to do that, what I'm going to use is I'm going to, I'm going to use a skew to start. Because all I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be coming right in just like this and cutting this back nice and flat. Now what other chisel could I use for that? I could use a parting tool. Now I've got a flat true back. Now I'm going to move again, but this time I'm, I'm going to go right back and seat tight against my chuck. I'm going to retrue myself just a little bit, make sure I'm running nice and smooth. Now why would I not been smooth to start with? The reason is, is because this tenon was in here, it wasn't perfectly straight to the back. So I could have knocked it sideways or just anything. So I just want to come back and true it up. The first thing you always want to do on any turning is to try to get yourself balanced. Now just as we did in the outfeed turning, we're going to be turning on the face. And it's going to be the exact same thing. And just as I did on the outfeed, I'm going to use my scraper. Now you're right. I, while I was over here on the side, I could have came in and flattened that surface with the skew or the parting tool. Now I'm going to get just a little, little bit more below that surface. So we'll just turn this rosette, which means we simply have kind of an oval surface turning in and then we create kind of like a large bullseye in the center and then of course it's carved a hand. 
but we'll create that. One of the things I failed to mention to you is I never turn it to a full circle or to a final size until I've got everything turned a little bit. And again, that has to do purely with getting this thing in as perfect a balance as I can get. That's going to give me the smoothest cuts. Now I'm going to come back and come down to my full si my size. Again, using that scraper. And you can see the surface we've, we're getting. Then I'm going to come back again, finish up my face. One of the things I'm going to do because I have this center in here is I'm going to take my skew and I'm going to come in gently and I'm going to roll around and let this part, the back edge of the blade, help me get rid of my little center there. I'm having a problem getting it, so I'm going to drop myself down a little bit. I'm going to hit it with a scraper on a little steeper angle. There we go. Now, how do you replicate or duplicate turning like this, where we've got all of these points? What you want to do is take, make yourself a pattern. 
And I do this all the time. I mean, I'll just take a piece of scrap, something thin, and turn it till I have my face profile like I want. Then, I, then again, I just saw it in half. And I take, because that gives me a clean, sharp edge, then I trace it out on a little thin piece of wood or whatever, and it gives me a side view or a side profile, and I can actually put it up and, put all, and mark everything exactly where I want, and as I'm turning, I can check my depths. And I can get them equal and the same. Now the same thing when we get into something like we looked at that little shaker knob. That's where having something like the chuck to hold the tenon is really a good thing. The other thing is, like I said, what I usually do is I'll take like an end grain or flat grain block just as we did on the rosette, and I drill it. And I drill it down pretty good. I, I measure the drilling, and I, and I glue a dowel in it. That gives me an end grain running through the pull. Or you can simply turn them out of end grain. But the thing you want to do is that this is where these chucks are just so nice. But the thing you do want to do is keep your, because it's in grain, one of the things you want to do, let me see if I got a, now I got too small of a, I need another, come on. One of the things that you want to do, I'm making sure my chuck will tighten up here. I need to slide my, yeah, I need to move that. But the point being is that this will tighten up on here and it simply holds. But here's the trick is that when you've got this in here, is bring your tail stock up when this is in a solid block, just like we did, and turn everything except your, your face out here. And keep, keep, the, keep that on it. That's gonna, that's gonna give you the most support, even on something small. Now, you know, common sense says that if you're doing something as small as that shaker knob, then you might wanna look around for some more chisels, because you can pick up some of the miniature chisels. And they're not super expensive and they do a nice job. You can also take some old screwdrivers that are pretty nice and stout. You don't want no wimpy ones because you don't want something to catch and bend over the tool rest and grind them to a profile. That works too. Bird cages, pedestals, tilt top tables. That's what we're going to look at now. Here's one. This is a tilt top we did, I don't know, years ago. And let's take a look at how it works and understand the turnings involved in it. This is what's called the bird cage. And what the bird cage does is it allows the top to swivel and tilt. That's what its purpose is. Now here's the way it works. What you have, simply put, is some dust. <laughs> anyway, the way this works is, you, as you can see, you've got a turn tenon and the way what you have here is the shaft right here the tenon goes through here has a pivot point on it that allows the piece to pivot and then you've got your little small turning in here that just creates the bird cage now the other thing it has once this is on you have a turned collar 
and what the, and you have a key. Now, if you look carefully, you'll notice there's a slot in the tenon. And what happens is, is the collar sits over it, and you'll notice that it has a groove in it for the key to slide through. It comes down on, and the key locks everything into position. Now, the easiest way, one of, the, one of the more difficult parts of this, in reality, is this slot right here. That's a little tough. The easiest way to do it is to drill this while your column or your pedestal is still straight. Before you do, you want to turn this tenon first and you want to turn the bottom part for fitting your feet in. We'll take a look at that. Oops. All right, then usually you will have a little catch right here that's mortised in to one of the faces of the birdcage. And you can buy these, and all it does is just a little slide catch that pulls back like so and locks the tilt top into a fixed position. The other thing you'll notice on this is that when you tilt it, the bottom of the birdcage creates a stop. Now here's another thing I want you to notice is that, and I'm going to show you where, how to hinge it, is that if you look carefully, I've had guys ask me if the tenons here where, we, where it rotates, where it hinges at, if that should be in the center of the table. No, it's offset, as you can well see. It's down here. So that when the tilt top comes down, the table sets centered to your pedestal. Now here's the way you make it. Here's a bird cage. And the way the battens, that the pieces that are go on the back of the tilt top, you always want them running across the grain. And they're simply screwed in and slotted holes so that the top can expand and contract. Then what you want to do, if you look at your bird cage, you notice the two little tenons on each on each side. And these fit into the holes that you've drilled. Now you're going to notice the hole is drilled down tight to the top. And it sets in here and it pivots. Now one of the things you want to do when you're making this is here's the way they were done. I have two pieces, and in this case they're four inches square, or they will be. But what we have to do is we literally have to turn the tenon on a small piece. It's then glued on to the other piece to form the tenons. Now you see some of the old ones, boy, they would, this thing was just nailed, man, they nailed it merciful, unmercifully. 
you know, this is about five inches square. This one's four, just to show you. Now, the other thing is, in the thickness of the wood, I rarely go under five eighths. This one on here, I think, is three quarters. But I want to turn a tenon that's going to fit my hole. That's important. Not be so tight that it can't move. Now, the other thing you're going to notice on the bird cage is right in this area at the top. This is where the tabletop would sit, right here. I've rounded that over. That's rounded so that the tilt top can move on it nicely. So let's look at how we turn the tenon. All right, what I've got is I've got my piece of stock that's going to become my pivot, my tenon. Now here's one you can see that's been turned and is already glued back on. Now one of the things you want to do is right here, you actually want a little bit more space than what this one is showing. And the reason for that space is what I'm talking about is you want the square part to extend out a little bit. Now the reason for that is, is that you can see it on this one. See this little shoulder right here? And the reason for that is, is that when your batten is on here, what that does is that creates a little space in there so that it can move freely. If you're tight up against it, then, you know, you're going to get issues. So, now the other thing I do is I always turn them long. That way I don't have to worry about getting right to the point here of either the spur center or the live center. So I just simply make me a mark. But I know that I want to leave just a little bit of space right there. Now what I could do would be to take my saw and nip this corner. Nip each one of those corners so that I don't chip out on the side. But I can also do it using my skew. So now I'm gonna set this to where I've gotta make sure I can see my line. I can see it just fine. So all I'm gonna do is slice it. Got my skew turned vertical, and all I'm doing is making a small cut. Now, because I'm working in a small area, I'm not going to be able to get my bigger scraper in there. So I'm just simply going to take the skew, and I'm just going to take the corners off. just around. I got a little bit of round right there on my tent. I need to cut a little more. All right, once I've done, gotten pretty close to round, using the drill bit, in this case it was a half inch. In the case of the walnut one here, it was five eighths. This is the drill bit I actually used to drill the hole with. I took my little sizing tool, set it up to fit that drill bit. Now, all I got to do is size my tenons.
Now you notice I never started to edge. If I get a little jump or a little catch in there, it's not going to hurt me if I'm out in, in free land, if I'm out here in the middle of it somewhere. Then I'm going to come in and I'm going to take this skew and I'm going to clean up this little corner right here. Right at my cut mark. Now I have it. Then I'm going to bandsaw the ends off. Make sure my tendons are fitting pretty good. They are. Then all I have to do is glue this back on and I have my turned tenons on each end to create my pivot points. Pretty much that simple. Then we get down on the bird cage to where we have to turn something in here. Now Again, the whole, the, you know, the tenon that's on the top of your pedestal right here has got to work within the, work with your birdcage. Now this one's obviously, this is just a pattern, and this one's obviously too tall. But again, it's set up just to be a pattern. This would normally be cut off to where this sets flush down on this collar right here. Now I was showing, I was, we were talking, okay, we were talking a little earlier about turning the pedestal itself. One of the things when you're turning a pedestal is you want to make sure that you turn the entire shaft and turn it straight. Then you'll notice that there's a step in this. And this is where our legs are going to be attaching. And this is where it gets dovetailed, a flat cut for the leg to fit into. The way that's done, of course, and, and you know that, is on the router table in a, in a little jig to keep it tight and keep it straight. At the same time, that's when you want to turn this top piece. And keeping all of this still straight then simply, then do your bird cage. Then you can come in and you can set your bird cage, turn your collar, it's gonna go on here. Then you can mark where you need to cut your slot for your little key to go through. Now one of the things I always do is I leave this tenon a little bit bigger than what I'm going to need. But I can still, once my bird cage is made up, I can get my measurement and I know where to, to drill it. Then I go to the drill press and I usually secure this with a clamp so it doesn't move around and I simply drill a series of holes with a brad point bit that will that just drill it all the way through that will create the slot for my key. The reason I leave it bigger is so that if on the back side, if I get a little tear out where the drill bit comes through, when I come back and turn everything nice, any tear out is then removed. That's the way you handle that puppy. Now, turning the collar, that can be interesting. The best way I've ever found to do it, I'm going to show you. All right, this is, this is actually quite simple. Because I'm only going to be working on the outside edge of it, 
I can simply go ahead and put it between the centers. Simple as that. And that's all I've done. I've, and then I came out and I turned the outside round. And now I'm just going to put a little profile right here, whatever I want. Once I'm done, then I can put it in a clamp, go to my drill press, and drill my center hole. Then I can just take a little chisel, a little saw, a little saw and saw across it on both sides and chisel out my little notch. Nothing to it. Now I'm going to use my little skewgee just because it'll let me get in here pretty tight. And as you can see on this one, it's just a cove and a little, couple little rings. Now what else could have I used in there? I could have used a round nose scraper. Create that code. Then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna take my skew and I'm gonna sneak right in here and I'm gonna cut that little top I'm going to do the same thing on the bottom. Then I'm going to round this just a little bit just for looks. Drill it, we got to sand it, drill it, we got a collar. Now one of the things you want to do when you're using, if when you're turning a collar, is make sure you turn it out of good sound solid wood and a good hard wood because, you know, there's not a whole lot of meat out here. Now this, you, this measures about three quarters of an inch from this point to this point. You don't want much less than that. Now let's take some measurements really quick. And this is kind of my typical bird cage. This is five by five. This one was a little smaller pedestal. It's about four and three eighths. Because I mentioned earlier that that one piece I had was four inches. I, I rarely go that small. Then the height on this is two and three quarter. That's the height of your little pedestal inside the bird cage. Now I'm going to show you something. Th this is just simply cut them the length, go between the spindles, and turn your profile. Now you're going to question about this tenon here and here. I'm going to show you how I do it. All right, I cheat. To turn those little tenons and drill it all just perfect is a pain. It really is. So here's what I do. Like I said, I cut them to length. I'm very particular when I mount it between the centers that I'm dead on my center because I want a nice flat bottom here and here. Once I've got them turned, I simply stack it. I put a little bit of glue on the bottom of each one of the little birdcage pedestals, put it together and clamp it. Let the glue dry. You already got it. You already figured it out. Once the glue's dry, okay, then I simply go to the drill press and I drill here, here. I drill my four points on both sides, 
drop a dowel in, glue a dowel into it. I usually come down, you know, about half inch into it, and I'm done. I don't have to fool with those little teeny tenons, and I get the exact same result. So it's kind of a loose tenon thing. Works just all too good. Works well. Bird cages. All right, guys, what we're going to do now is a turn foot on a cabriolet leg. Now, one of the things I, I want to have you understand, now you see where I've got it centered out. I, I did all four corners, and that's why you get the double lines, because this is bandsaw, and it's not perfectly square. But this showed me my true center. If you go to the dead center of a cabriolet foot, what you're going to do is you're actually going to kick the foot forward and you're going to wind up taking a lot of material off of your uh, heel back here. So one of the things you want to do depending upon the foot and what you're doing is play a little bit with a pattern or a mock, you know, just a scrap to figure out your offset. Now in this case, I'm back from the center about a quarter of an inch and we'll see what that does so you understand it now the other thing I did I kind of took a compass and drew and then I drew a circle right here that'll be what will be actually my pad now you'll see what I'm talking about just in a minute now you're putting this thing on a lathe and it is anything but straight so it's going to look pretty weird Now one of the things you want to do is you want to make sure, because as this thing goes round, as you can see, it's looking kind of strange. See there? See where you got the knee up here? Now the other thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you start on a very, very low speed. That's a weird looking thing, isn't it? But what you're going to be working on is right here. Now here's the trick. The thing that can whop you hard or your fingers is right here. Is this the back of the heel? Right in here. Because this is coming around. What you can do is take a pencil or take a magic marker or something because all of this will get spoke shaved away and darken that so that you have a good visual concept of where it's at. Now all I'm going to do is I'm going to start out just simply with a scraper. Just, I'm just going to get the corners off pretty easy. Might help to get a little pressure on it. Get now the other thing, now I'm doing this, but now I'll tell you what else is a good idea to do. I'm doing this to show you as I always kind of take a bandsaw and knock these corners down. Whole lot safer and a whole lot easier. As it's turning in the ghost, let me turn this up just a little bit. I call it ghost turning because you can actually see the round.
Now, could I use a skew to do this or use a... Um, you know... A, can't think, guys. Or use a uh, gouge? Yeah, I could. But you can see what's happening. See, the front is coming down, but I'm, I'm maintaining my back. Now, if I went further forward on this to the center, then what's going to happen is this, this part's going to start getting it heavier. And what that does is that winds up kicking my foot. I was off center there a little bit. What that winds up doing is that winds up kicking, taking the, like I told you, the back off of here and it puts the foot way too far forward. Now, as I'm looking, I'm looking across the top. I can see my black magic marker. Now, I can actually, by just gently coming into this, I can actually round the back of the leg just a little. But go slow and go easy. See where it's taking that down? But you can see, even with a quarter inch back set, My foot is still pretty far forward. Notice something else too. I'm chiseling this kind of on an angle. That's going to form a pad. has a little off center you can see I've got a little bit there I need to sharpen the scraper All right, as you see it coming in the round you start to understand what you're getting Now at this stage of the game, what I'm going to do is I've got to take meat out of here to form the pad. I've got to round the ankles and all of that. But in order to keep my pad looking nice, now this is a little bit thicker than I like, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a cut line. That's a scribe line, that's all that is. Okay, it'll probably remain here in the back. But what that's going to do is that's going to show me where to finish my foot out. And then I can also turn a little bit more. I can turn a bead on it. I can do anything I want. Now because you're set up in what's in an eccentric turning situation, you're going to look in here and you're going to see 
right where it, it joins or comes to the live center, which you're, it's going to look like it's a wobble to it. That's normal. Don't turn that out. And the reason for that is, is that when the leg is then mounted in the furniture, okay, it would be off because it's designed to set in that capacity. Now, what this needs now is to be finished out and we would have a cabriolet leg and this forms their foot. Now, there's more meat needs to come out in here. If we would have turned this further forward, what we would have had, we would have taken a whole lot more off of our back heel. And that would have thrown the foot way forward. They look odd doing that. The other thing is, is that we lose our shear. We lose that point of, of there's a center line here that you want to maintain of this grain going to the floor all the time. So if this kicked way out, then you can have an issue. Now here's a little fun one. I'm backing up about another half inch or another quarter inch total half. Let me get a sharp chisel here. And if you want, you can put the lady on high heels. Play with your moving forward and back. Play with, play with your offset to get the foot that you want. Now again, this looks kind of clunky in here because I just kind of, I didn't even, I just whacked one out so to show you. <coughs> 